Hello everybody. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon probably for some of you. Um, my name is Marta Kyle. I'm a performing arts curator and one of the team of the, one of the gang, should I say, of the instigators that uh, initiated the Grand Reunion project. And I'm extremely happy to welcome with me today Carolina Vigura. Uh, hello, Carolina. Hi, hello. Hi, Marta. Hi, everybody. Um, Carolina is one of the, of the greatest voices that command at the moment, not only the current political uh, and social situation in Poland, but all over the world. And we are extremely happy that um, we can invite Carolina to, to share with you all today her um, point of view on the current situation in politics both in the local and transnational context and the role of emotions and before i give um voice to you i would just love for the ones who might uh not uh not know you yet i would just like to say a few words um that carolina Vigura is a sociologist a historian of ideas and a journalist and she is a member of of cultura liberana at the foundation board and assistant professor in the institute of sociology here in warsaw at the university we are both talking to you at the moment from warsaw and um she's been publishing in, in numerous uh, press outlets including the new york times foreign policy the journal of democracy the guardian the new york social Zeitung, perhaps and um Today we'll be talking about the, the emotions, how to take emotions seriously, especially when it comes to politics. And since we are um, um, streamed on Facebook, we would love to um, welcome you all to put your questions, inquiries, thoughts uh, during the talk in the comments. I'll be very happy to put them together and, and we will definitely address them towards the end of the talk. Carolina, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very warm welcome. And at the same time, I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, event and also to be invited by your gang, as you say. Um, so um, I will just start very quickly from three um, introductory points, because I, I have been thinking about how to start and how to basically get into the subject. And then I thought I would like to make um, hope uh, a frame for what I am going to do today, to what I'm going to say today. Because, you know, I come from Poland and Poland is one of the few places in the world where when you are asked, how are you, you don't answer, I'm fine. You answer, it's horrible and the weather is bad so so having all that in mind i always try to be on the contrary to be more optimistic so i i hope that that this this exactly this optimism but rather strategic and emotional optimism and not a naive um, uh, optimism will be a frame for what i am going to say today so this is the first um uh, starting point the second starting point is what you can expect from me. I am trained as a historian of ideas, and this is the first, uh, the, my first training. So what I am interested in is basically the life of ideas during centuries of philosophical thought. So I, what I am trying to do is not basically only rely on the associations that we can have with politics or emotions today, but rather to look for keys in the past to what is happening in the world, in the politics. And the third, the third starting point uh, concerns emotions. Why emotions and why emotions are so important? Well, basically I do believe that emotions precede politics. We often think that our politics should be different, but what I would like to stress is that emotions precede politics. This means that if we want to change something about politics, we basically have to change something about emotions. And in order to, to, to change emotions, we basically have to understand what is happening with the emotions, what those emotions are. So um, without um, more talking, I will take you straight to the story. The story I would like to start with is a story that is opening a novel. 
the novel is called The Place and it has been written by a French author, Annie Arnaud. This is a book about France, but basically it could also be about my country. It could also be about your country. And this is about, uh, this is a book which is starting with a scene of a funeral. Annie Arnaud, an adult, uh, she is usually uh, the, the heroine of her own books. So she, as an adult woman, is uh, at a funeral of her own father. And in the first scene, she is looking at the coffin in which uh, her father's body is put. And she says, the first word that comes into my mind now is guilt. Now, why guilt? What has happened? And all the uh, exorcism of memories starting there from this point, as usually in Annie Ernaud's books. And this exorcism of memory leads us to understand her way, her road, uh, and how she achieved everything in her life and what what the consequences of this ascent were. Namely, she was born in, uh, uh, in, in a rather poor family in rural France, and she uh, changed herself from a girl, from a peasant uh, French family into a renowned French and international intellectual translator and writer. And this has been a tremendous success, of course, but at the same time, it's also a tremendous cost. So the cost is, of course, her own relationship with her father. The cost is her relationships with the friends that she had in the city, in the, in the village where she was born. The cost is also a traditional imagination of who she might have become, but she has become someone completely else. And of course, this, this cost, the loss here is mutual because it's not only her that has lost her father and the time with her father, the, the, the possibility of being with her father, but also he lost his dreams about spending his older years with his daughter. And I do believe that this is an extremely important book to understand what has been happening in my country, in Polish, but also in international politics in the past few years. Mainly, my argument, my, main, my main argument is that every ascent, every success, every gain means also loss. And the more a success we have, the more loss we also have. So as I said, this book is about friends, but it also could be about my country. And I do believe that this is exactly what has happened to Poland in the last 30 years. Namely, we have achieved a lot. The story of this success has been described in the international press and also in international research. But the, this gain, this success at the very same time meant loss. And when I'm saying about loss, I do not necessarily mean only the loss in economic terms. So of course, there were people who lost their jobs. And of course, there were people who, who went back bankrupt. And this is for sure. But I mean loss in a wider sense. I mean that people as a society, this Polish society has lost also traditional sources of, of, of identity, for example, lost, has lost old habits of how they behaved through decades and decades. They lost networks of relationships. So our, our life has been changing a lot uh, throughout those 30 years. And I'm, when I'm talking about this, I'm always also talking about my own family. I understand myself as an example of a transformational success. So due to the transformation and due to the success that my, my family actually had, I was able, for example, to educate myself very, very well. But at the same time, the, 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 the family, so to say, has been deconstructed during those 30 years. And I do believe this is not a private story. This is a story which actually touches on what happened to the Polish society. 
So if, ask, if someone asked, asked me after 2015, why the Poles have, cha have, have chosen such a ruling party, a ruling party that was talking about Poland in ruins, a ruling party that has reverted a lot of what has been achieved before, I always answer, it's not on the contrary to the success, it's not despite of the success, it's because of the success. This is the consequence of the success. Because this is where, uh, th this was the moment, 2015, when the ambivalence of Polish road, of Polish transformation was the most visible. So it's as if you, um, you, you looked into this wonderful book by Charles Dickens, which is called A Tale of Two Cities. You have those first sentences of the book when he writes, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We, it was a spring of hope and it was the winter of despair. So um, I do believe that illiberal politicians were the first and the most skillful to grasp this ambivalence. And what happened after 2015 was a consequence of that. But as I said before, this process has also something global to it. It's not only a Polish local phenomenon. And I do believe that 1989, the democratic breakthrough that that underwent uh, 30 years ago. When you look, when you remember a little bit what was before COVID-19 pandemic, it was, two, it was 2019 and everybody was talking about the 30th anniversary of the democratic breakthrough in Central and Eastern Europe. And I have been reflecting, why for everybody, for so, oh, maybe not everybody, but why for so many people around the globe, this was a very important point of reference, even though this was something regional, this democratic breakthrough. And my hypothesis is because 1989 be, means not only the democratic breakthrough in Central and Eastern Europe, but it is also uh, a starting point of a huge change in our societies. So, for example, there were very positive developments. The developments uh, that, that were connected with our longevity, with technology, with communication, with uh, living standards improvement. But they all came at a huge cost. So you had a simultaneous uh, uh, development and ascent and, and at the same time you had the costs. And as, as I said before, costs and loss understood not only in economic, but also in a very broad sense. Now, we start to understand that populists, uh, or as they are called, illiberal politicians, they do not buy the voters. It has been very often said about my country, for example, that Populists bought Polish vote voters by giving them direct money transfers. Well, I think money transfers are, of course, not irrelevant. But, in fact, they are not the deep reason for the popularity of uh, the, uh, of the revolution uh, revolutionary uh, right in Poland, the Law and Justice Party. Actually, what populists actually did was they operated on a, on a very deep level of, of the ambivalence that people felt. So they appealed to very strong longings. They communicated with the feeling of loss. And I do believe that when they communicated with the feeling of loss, feeling of loss being something vague and something very broad, they were skillful to translate this vague feeling into something uh, into some more clear emotions. So, for example, they, uh, it is not a chance that populists, not only in Poland, but also in the U US, in the Netherlands, in Germany, they very often refer to some um, perfect imaginary state from the past. So they are very reactionary, so to say. They speak about traditional values or traditional family. They speak about making some country great again. So 
this is exactly how they are translating the feeling of loss. They, they translate the feeling of loss if, into some nostalgia for the past that is gone, and it is, it is actually a past which is projected, uh, constructed, but still it's appealing because of the ambivalence uh, the societies are, are feeling. Now, it's very important that I stress here that it is not that I'm praising illiberal politicians. I do believe that the solutions that they are coming with, uh, coming up with, are very often deconstructing democracy. And I do believe that those solutions are very often toxic for the political community. But I am not blind to their talent or skills in communicating with the emotional side of society. Um, and this is extremely important because at the time when illiberal politicians were able to grasp the feeling of loss and translate it into many other feelings, the liberals were usually ridiculing the same feeling of loss. They were ridiculing using emotions in politics at all. And I, I do believe that we have to go back somehow. So understand that illiberal politicians were very good at communicating with feelings, which means that we also have to go back to feelings again and not ridicule or depart from emotions. It is especially important because we also know from neurology that and neuroscience that actually the research uh, shows us that our brains are on the side of illiberal politicians using emotions and using uh, the feeling of loss in order to make their political project effective. Namely, we know from neuroscience that when there is too much change, our brains basically focus on what's negative about the change. This is a very important evolutionary reaction, which was important for us as a species in the past. But we, we shouldn't neglect that. We should rather treat the feeling of loss very seriously. Now, it's also uh, important to stress, perhaps, that I understand why the opponents of illiberal politicians are so reluctant to work with feelings. Many of them think about the past and think about the times where, when, when emotions were manipulated by enemies of democracy and when this manipulation led to atrocities. It is obvious that many opponents of illiberal politicians think about Nazi Germany and about how emotions may be manipulated into excluding the whole groups and then mass murder of those groups. We don't have to uh, search so far away in Nazi Germany. We also can think about the war in Oh, in, in ex-Yugoslavia in the 90s. This is again, again an example of a situation where emotions were manipulated uh, in or, for, for political reasons and then atrocities um, were the consequence of this manipulation. So many, many people who defend democracy would rather argue, well, we should perhaps cool down emotions, think about politics only with the help of the reason, and this should be what we actually should do. We shouldn't do anything more. And many, many European um, thinkers, great thinkers like, for example, Jürgen Habermas would say, this is the right thing to do. We should depart from hot emotions. And for example, look for intellectual uh, sources of patriotism. And I understand that this, this argumentation has its sources and it's, it's perhaps the argument to, to use it is very strong. 
But as I, as I told you at the beginning, I am trained uh, first and foremost as a historian of ideas. And when I think about my uh, favorite philosophers of politics who are classic philosophers, so for example, about Plato, about Montesquieu, about Adam Smith, all those who, who have dealt with great change in their societies and reflected on reason and emotions, then you can find a completely different answer. So they would rather say, it's a, it is not about departing from emotions. It is not about cooling down emotions. It is rather about choosing which emotion would be best to work with reason. And which is one which is completely not to be tolerated when we want to have reasonable politics. So many of them would say, for example, respect towards the law or respect towards institutions of the state is a reasonable emotion. Even perhaps some of them would defend fear of the law. But if you think about super, superstitions and such fear, the superstitious fear, they would say, no, this is uh, a feeling that will not lead us to any good place. So it is not about emotions as such. It is about which one is working well with politics, which is democratic and which gives us more stability. So what does it mean in practice? How can we go back to working with feelings? What can we do? Well, uh, I would like to, to stress that the way the illiberal politicians are translating feeling of loss into other feelings is not the only way. So they have translated the feeling of loss into, as I said, reactionary feeling, nostalgia towards the past, um, defending your own family, defending your own country, then some negative emotions, resentment towards your neighbors, fear of the people who might come, refugees, for example, the, the people who are slightly different, the LGBT community, etc. So this is what they are doing. It doesn't mean, though, that the feeling of loss is just something we cannot use when we try to communicate with the people, with the voters. I do believe that we can also translate feeling of loss into emotions that will serve political community better. And one of the, the, the ideas I would like to present is that we, would, we, we, we are able, we are capable, I, I, I do believe, in our political communities to translate feeling of loss into empathy and hope. The Polish noblest uh, Nobel winner, Olga, Olga Tokarczuk, in her wonderful Nobel lecture um, a couple of months ago, it seems now after COVID, uh, COVID lockdown, it seems that it was 10 years ago, but no, it was just a couple of months ago, actually. But in her noble lecture, she spoke of tenderness as the most modest way to love others. And my thinking of empathy is to some, some extent similar to what Olga Tukarczuk means when she writes about tenderness. Namely, feeling of loss has a strong connection to personal grief. When we think about loss, we often start from what we have lost as persons, as members of families. And our cultures tell us exactly what we should do when we lose something, when we feel grief, what we do actually with people from our own family when they feel grief. What do we say to them? We say, lie down, take a blanket. So we treat them a little bit like people who are ill, who have to take some time in order to recover because recovering from grief of course brings hope but it's only possible if grief is met by empathic reaction 
So I do believe that it's very difficult to think about empathy on a societal level. I understand that we most normally think about empathy in context in the context of our families or friends or partners or at least people who think similarly. But to be sure, I'm not calling for empathy for Jarosław Kaczyński or for Donald Trump or for other illiberal politicians. I'm calling for empathy for those people who are the supporters and perhaps not all the supporters, but those supporters that are not aggressive, not radical, rather reluctant, ambivalent, perhaps potential supporters. Perhaps you also have such people in your families. I do, for example. I do have such people in my, in my, in my family. And I do believe that when we think about those people, it is easier to also think about uh, a broader number of voters. Now, there are even some political projects that have been already uh, successful in bringing empathy into the core of political project. In our region, for example, in Central and Eastern Europe, you have Zuzana Chaputova in Slovakia, who appealed to empathy very openly during her campaigns. Also uh, in Poland, I understand that Rafał Trzaskowski lost the elections, but he actually had a very similar project. He, has, he had this project of new solidarity, which was meant to be a project where everybody, regardless who or uh, who she or he is, is accepted and, and helped. So I do believe that, that not only empathy might be uh, a good idea from the, from the philosophical point of view, but also it shows that it can bring political effectiveness. A footnote for everybody uh, who, who, who is not Polish, uh, I, I was speaking about the candidate that lost the presidential elections, but I, I'm not sure whether you know what, uh, how, how small the difference was between the two candidates. It was 400,000 votes. So you can say that even though he lost, his political project was well spelled. Now, I would like now for the very last remarks, I would just like to add something which is another layer of my thinking uh, being uh, created during the COVID-19 pandemic. Namely, uh, what I have been describing um, so far is rather a reflection about what we can say about emotions after 30 years, uh, after 1989. But during the past few months, I do believe that there has been built another layer of emotions which also matter on a collective and political level. And this is something that we also know from the past testimonies about pandemics. We know that pandemics are basically a collective emotional event. So I will just speak about three, uh, three emotions that are very, sim very similarly uh, repeating themselves in epidemics and pandemics in the history of Europe and not only of Europe. I will on only name three of them. The first one is of course fear. So you can, you have, uh, you have testimonies of fear in Boccaccio's Decameron, for example, who writes about fearing your own neighbors. And you also have uh, Thucydides, who in the history of Peloponnesian War uh, is writing about uh, how people collectively started to be afraid of sudden death when there was a plague in Athens. So you have fear and you can see this very similar fear when you when you uh, use the underground on daily basis today or when you bring your ch children to school or when you go to work if you have to work outside your home now the second of course is suspicion so this is also an emotion that we can find uh, throughout the history of any epidemic uh, in europe and beyond in the in the past centuries. So for example, as, uh, as early as in the 14th century, 
the pogroms of Jews have been described as a consequence of Black Death because people believed, were suspicious that perhaps Jews were the ones who brought the disease. But also Thucydides, I spoke about him before, Thucydides also wrote that, that the Greeks were afraid, the, uh, the Athenians were afraid that per perhaps the plague ca came from Peloponnesians poisoning water. So when you today read, for example, that COVID-19 is a Chinese a conspiracy or even worse a Jewish Chinese a conspiracy then you know that the reactions have been already seen such reactions have been have been already seen in our history and also the feeling of suspicion is something that that is that is present throughout our history and third of course our uncertainty so this is um, a, 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 an emotion which is connected for us today with lockdown and how we actually didn't know during the most severe lockdown whether this works and whether those decisions are actually well made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the in the past testimonies, for example, you can see that uh, something that was weakened from the one day to another when when epidemics, when plagues. Uh, plagues started was, for example, the rule of law. So people were not sure anymore whether the rule of law works or not, whether you can walk in the street and be safe, for example. And also all those ethical dilemmas that we have. Um, now, perhaps in some countries where we are today now, the, the, the virus is there, but somehow it has become a part of uh, of normality so people are not afraid so much but re do you remember for example the first weeks in Italy where there were all those discussions what to do when you have five persons that need need a, a, a respirator and you have only one machine so this question about who will be drowned and who will be saved is actually a question which is also pos um, um, present throughout our history now of course, I will add to that one more emotion, which is which has been not so much present in the past testimonies, but I do believe that there is also a fourth one, and it is a new spectrum, a new kind of loss. Namely, I do believe also that lockdown, the, the most severe quarantine restrictions meant loss of old habits and way of life and also uh, loss of space for many many persons and i would very much like to talk at length uh, perhaps later on with you because i would love to know to what extent you think this loss is an ongoing loss and to what extent you have recovered for example i have been um, uh, feeling a tremendous loss during the the severe lockdown and today I have a feeling that I have completely re recovered or even regained uh, my, my life in a new way, um, per perhaps in a better way, better, perhaps it's better so. But I would very much like to, to, to know your, your reactions. And I'm talking about this because um, I think after few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, we already understand that the, corona, the, the the coronavirus is not something that is going to just disappear overnight. We perhaps thought so at the very beginning. We probably thought in a month, in two months, in six months, this is going to be over. But today we rather understand that it's more like Black Death that lasted once during one of the epidemics in, in Europe. It lasted seven years. This seems quite re reasonable. Perhaps the coronavirus is going to be with us now for two or three or five years. Nobody knows. But what I would like to stress is that this is the new normality. It's not that normality is going to come back to us. No, this is the new normality. And this has a very important political meaning because it also uh, demands from us new thinking about politics. It also perhaps demands from us new types of leadership. And this, this, um, this new uh, 
types of, of politics is extremely important. New types of, of leadership is extremely important because you, we can already uh, have seen, we, we have already seen, uh, we have already seen in, in for example, in my par part of, of, of Europe, that some of the politicians, the illiberal politicians have used COVID-19 to empower themselves. The best example is probably Viktor Orban and his uh, ruling by decree. Uh, just because he decided this is the good pretext to introduce ruling by decree. So this is why I'm saying that we uh, not only need new leadership, a new, new type of politics which understands uh, the loss that has, been, uh, that has been present in the past 30 years, but also we need leaders who understand that all those emotions of pandemic that I have um, I, have, I have named, so fear, uncertainty, uh, and suspicion. All those emotions can also be changed and translated into emotions that serve our politi po political community well. So just a very small example. You can turn fear into, into courage, for example. You can change uncertainty into creativity, and you can change mistrust and suspicious, sus suspicion into responsibility. So the, the task is to not to neglect the emotions, but rather to embrace them. It's like my, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Michel de Montaigne wrote, people are bothered not with the things themselves, but with Th what they think and what they feel about those things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, just to remind our listeners and viewers that if you, I don't see any questions at the moment, but if you like to, to share some of your thoughts or maybe doubts or maybe questions, please do feel free to put them in their comments on, on the Facebook. And meanwhile, I will allow myself to, to ask one question to, to you, Carolina, if you like. Um, I, I was really, uh, it was really striking for me and, and fascinating to hear you and especially to hear um, one of the last of your remarks of the new normality that is already here, um, that there is no back to normal. And I have to say that this statement makes me I realized when it comes to the emotions that this statement, uh, I, I, per, I perceive it as a kind of, with a kind of relief. I don't, I realized I don't want going back to normal. I think uh, normal has been normal just for very few of us. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, and therefore I was wondering um, about your thoughts concerning this new, um, new thinking about politics and new, uh, forms of leadership we need. And I just wanted to add to it probably a kind of new ways, uh, one of the needs that we actually discuss quite a lot within the arts field and also within this very project, which is a grant reunion, is exactly as its name says, this really strong need to find ways to gather again, to regather, if you will, but also to find a way to actually gather and get together um, with, in the field while n the physical presence with each other is not possible anymore. And mm -hmm. this, um, this constatation makes me think of the, of the movement of, of different forms of leadership or maybe different forms of common leadership that we were witnessing, witnessing um, during the last decade. I, I, of course, I mainly uh, mean the Occupy movement, but not only. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering whether you, you are observing at the moment in the yeah, political, maybe also social field, any kind of initiatives or are there any that would be especially interesting for you that would already try to, to think of new types of getting together, of uh, kind of creating new types of bonds between each other, if you will. Do you observe any of the movements Mm -hmm. um, can you, uh, for instance, maybe, um, do you see any kind of link between the new type of leadership and the way how the, uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter uh, mm -hmm. unfolds in the recent days, or maybe here in the Polish local context, 
the, mov the movement that supports the LGBTQ plus community that has been witnessing a severe, severe restrictions from, from the government? I think you're very right to say that that um, we, we, we do need new type of movements. And um, my fear from the very beginning when the pandemic started and we, when we were locked, my fear was that um, there is a need of a new um, type of, of communication because at the time where when the public sphere in real was empty and the dim was only online it felt very unnatural mm. so um what what i thought at the time was that again uh, my my classic philosophical friends as i as i like to think about them they all i mean many of them warned of public sphere being emptied because when public sphere is empty and people are only in private sphere this smells with dictatorship this is where dictatorship starts uh, but uh, what makes me hopeful after those few months is that firstly it seems that the pandemic played as a catalyst of some movements that were very much needed. So when I think about Black Lives Matter and about all the discussion that is connected with the Black Lives Matter, I think this is exactly the example. This is exactly what happened. Uh, many of the reasons for, for, for the existence of this movement were, were present for years and decades. And I, for example, I, I, for example I, I remember when I was living at Oxford in 2016, 2018, and already there was a discussion about the monument of Rhodes. And already there were uh, questions and, 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 and ideas to, to, to make this, this monument fall down, uh, to, to get rid of the monument because of the history of and, and personality and biography of Rhodes himself. And the, the movement was, was actually needed to make something change because not enough has changed during the few years when I have been observing this. So again, the virus was the catalyst here. And I do believe this is a beginning of an extremely important discussion. Uh, Black Lives Matter and the, the movement which is connected with, uh, with the monuments. Um, also because I, I do believe there are some very important questions here. Like for example, if we are developing not only technologically but also morally and as a liberal optimist, I will tell you, I believe we do very, perhaps very slowly, but we do develop from one century to another. But if we are developing, does it give us the right to get rid of the, all the, all the mon mon monuments of people that we uh, today uh, regard disgusting because of their views? This is a question I would like to just to, to leave it there as a, as a, as a, as a rhetorical question we, we might discuss later on. An argument that comes to my mind very often is that perhaps in one or 200 years, we will be all vegetarians. Should we then get rid of all the monuments of people who have, who have, uh, who have eaten meat? I think it's a very ser serious question. So, um, this this is one one part perhaps of the answer um and i also do believe that the 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 deem connected with uh with the 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 rights of the lgbt lgbt persons in poland is again uh, this has this has been somehow uh mm, empowered by the covid-19 pandemic and rightly so again rightly so Although here 
you you have also some other dynamic it, it's not it is not only a social movement which is demanding rights but also you have very cynical politicians uh, playing out the subject so this is this is something perhaps slightly different although in the same category have i under un answered your question <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and I think you also opened uh, several new uh, directions I would immediately like to cut. But maybe just one remark before I refer to some of the questions that appeared already is um, uh, concerning the, the monuments, as, as of course this is probably one of the most heated topic uh, nowadays. I'm just wondering, also having in mind the emotions we are talking about, that maybe since the pandemic was kind of an amplifier, a catalyst mm -hmm. for also a lot of emotions, maybe indeed uh, we need to, uh, this kind of anger that leads to um, abolishing some of the monuments mm -hmm. or er erasing them maybe for a moment from the city landscapes mm -hmm. is needed in order to, in a way, reset our minds or reshift the attention to possible other narratives. Mm -hmm. Maybe the the, the anger of uh, such a long hegemony mm -hmm. of racist, of uh, uh, patriarchic uh, narratives that were dominating is so huge that there was no other way. And maybe this, and maybe it's not the way how the path for all of us will look like for the next months and years. It's, I don't mean we will now only destroy what we've already built, it's rather trying to make some space, at least for a moment. Mm -hmm. for other narrative and maybe narratives and maybe indeed this kind of gesture is, is needed um but just to just yes, to come back yes. to one of the questions from from Rivka uh one of the, our uh, our listener uh there was a question um concerning the list of the emotions that you that you gave as um the, there is a mm -hmm. question whether you could repeat how can we, um, in a way, transform fear, suspicion, uncertainty, and the, the feel of loss into other, maybe more positive or maybe more hopeful emotions, if you could come back to it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so basically, my argument is that we, uh, those uh, emotions that are me I mentioned uh, are very broad this is ve this is the first remark and we have to understand that that all those emotions can have more positive more, more positive and more negative faces so uh, i think it's it's a it, fear is a very good example here and uh, how uh, fear can mean many different things i will give you an example from 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 uh, history in a moment but um, I, would, I wanted to stress one more thing. We often perceive emotions are as, as only good or only bad. So for example, we say fear is bad because it brings, for example, the possibility of, um, of, of um, uh, making, uh, of, of uh, uh, taking away rights from a certain mi minority or this is a base for, uh, for example, fearing the refugees and, and creating uh, um, a politics uh, which is based on intolerance. And this, this is why fear is bad, full stop. But my argument is different. My argument is that every emotion has a good, at least one good face and one bad face. Of course, you can say, what about hatred? Um, hatred is always bad. And I will say, yes, almost always. But can you, for example, uh, imagine uh, a passionate defender of democracy during the Second World War without hatred for totalitarianism. Well, I do believe that strong passions in some situations are, um, uh, are, are to be explained, are explainable. And I wanted to give you an example of what can we, what, 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 what can, we do, can be done or, or how, how the difference may, um, may, uh, may look like. Uh, I referred today to, to the history of Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, and there, there, is this, this, uh, there are two, these two um, pictures of the Athenian political community. You have the, the picture of the Athenian uh, political community in the Pericles funeral oration, where the Athenians are people which are 
deeply devoted to law, you, you might say it, they are afraid of the laws uh, and they are afraid of the judges. And to see that this basically uh, suggests it is rightly so. It should be like this because it works well with political community. And when Pericles is, is, um, uh, is talking about it, he as, as a political leader also stresses how this, this, uh, this fear of the law and respect to, towards the law and also towards the one, one people to another uh, is, is, is very uh, crucial to how the political community of Athenians look like. And then after a few pages, you have a completely different uh, portrayal of the Athenian community. You have the plague, and what he stresses is that everybody is afraid of sudden death, because if you are sick with this horrible disease, you basically, well, th this is basically a life sentence. So something horrible is happening to the political community. Um, the best people, the most uh, altruistic persons go to the sick ones and they help and they die. The most egoistic persons, the most uh, concentrated on themselves, on themselves, narcissistic, I would, uh, as, as we would say today, uh, people that just stay at homes and they survive. So the political community is basically uh, being um, deconstructed completely. So this is an example of how one emotion can have so many different faces and how how politicians, how leaders can, can use those faces of, of emotions that bring stronger political community. Thank you so much. And um, maybe another question. Um, I will read it out loud uh, for everybody. Do you think that the stronger focus on the development of emotional intelligence in the education system could be something valuable in the long term? Could mm -hmm. more awareness, knowledge about our own emotional life have a political effect? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a great question. I mean, there, there, there are two questions here, actually. Mm -hmm. One question is about emotional intelligence. And the, the answer is yes. Um, but I don't think this has to be done in a very open way as uh, let's just make a course of emotional intelligence now for children and we will save our community. Because, uh, you know, I have been, I have been observing uh, the, the, the um, schooling system in my country and also in other countries. My, my children have been in preschools and schools in, in Berlin and Oxford and Warsaw and I have been observing uh, all those systems for some time now and it 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 uh, brought me to a conclusion I, I would like very much like to to know what you think about what you all, all think about it but it brought me very much to a conclusion that courses in emotional intelligence or civic engagement basically do not have any sense what makes sense is treating the children and the students every day in such a way that so to say they are taught indirectly all those things so if a pupil or a student is is uh, treated with respect and empathy he or she will then respect respect and be empathetic towards other but if you have a system which is deeply unempathetic and and not respectful towards those persons and then you make just some lessons about how civic engagement or emotional intelligence are important then no nothing simply nothing will happen and of course um, there is a huge question about schooling here and education uh, which is also very personal for me to now because i have moved uh, my, my older son into a, a private school uh, from, from September, from this year. And I can see that he is being extremely well taught. This is an extremely good school, exactly for those reasons I just meant, I, I, just, I, just, I just mentioned. But the question is, how do we make sure that not the, only the minority is taught this way in a society? How do we make such respectful and empathetic system 
the normality for everybody. Because if, if we just teach minority in private schools like this, then you will al always have a minority of, of people who, di who, who think differently and a majority uh, which perhaps then, perhaps I say perhaps, uh, work, uh, 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 vote, uh, choose uh, illiberal populism, for example. So this is perhaps a, a, an attempt to, to answer the first, the first question. Could more awareness and knowledge about our own emotional life have a political effect? Uh, I, I don't think this is a yes or no question, but, but, but yes, I do believe that it, it makes a lot of difference, especially uh, when I observe now political discussions, for example, in Poland, and the huge amount of polarization, which is one of the nightmares of, of our political life, but obviously not only Polish political life, I, I often feel, think that where we need more training is exactly in trying to, to be more uh, respectful and empathetic towards people who, t who think completely differently and not uh, about uh, the, the people who, who just think the same. Uh, and, and it seems that uh, the bigger polarization, the, 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 the more difficult empathy actually becomes. So um, um, it all looks from time to time for me as, as if um, there was an, an ideology of empathism towards our own people. But when it comes to the other group, then we are completely, we have our eyes completely closed to what they might feel, think. Um, yeah. This is absolutely fascinating, I guess, also for, especially maybe for us, by us, I mean the, the, the art workers, uh, the ones deeply involved in the in the arts field, no matter as producers, artists, curators, thinkers, because I guess um, this is one of the biggest traps we uh, we face is to actually preach to the converted mm -hmm. very often and being involved in in sometimes really fascinating political initiatives, artistic political initiatives, artivism and not being able to reach out from the field we operate uh, with uh, anyways. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I try to realize or, or to understand what has happened actually, why uh, so often during last years we feel a min minority in our own country and we feel like not very welcomed in our own country, is probably because we claimed working in the public field especially here in Poland and in Europe where the arts is being funded publicly and we are so proud about it. But we kind of lost interest, I think, who this public actually is. Who are, whom are we talking to? And I guess uh, without, and in, indeed in that circumstances, the empathy seems to be crucial in order to build a, a common space and a possibility of a dialogue. But again, in order to do so, we need to give ourselves or allow ourselves to expose to a difference. And I think this is one of the most challenging things at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and just maybe uh, mentioning uh, uh, another question or, or another observation that just appeared. Um, again, from Rivka Rubin, I have a populist sympathizing in my family despite me being able to engage with people, strangers who do not share my preferred views and can create a connection with them leads to conversation. With my brother, I often take an emotionally charged position of ethical superiority. And that's the end of the conversation for weeks. When I have connected with him through empathy and curiosity, he asked me to propose some reading materials. Mm -hmm. I have sadly not yet found any he can understand. He left school at 15 and has never read one book. Short attention, hand strap, et cetera, language works on him. Mm -hmm. 
this is fascinating. I thought I, I instantly thought that we might some somehow um, in in some configuration come up with a project uh, where each of us would very um, truthfully say about our own so to say sins in where we are unable to be um, empathetic and this is because i, I deeply respect that that uh, rivka is 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 trying to say something also critical uh, about uh, ha own behavior yes uh, i for example c could say that my biggest challenge is to be empathetic with this is paradoxical my 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 biggest challenge is to be empathetic with people who are on my own side but more radical that, than I am. This is my, because I, in a way, uh, I have this automatic reaction when I hear that someone thinks com something completely else, I change into ears, yes? I'm all ears and I just listen and this is very interesting. As if, as if I was listening to someone who just uh, came from another planet and this is so interesting and I'm looking for the common ground, etc but it's it, it's extremely difficult to to engage into for me to engage into such conversation with a person who thinks similarly but i believe my interpretation is that he or she is more radical uh, then i i i feel instantly uh, completely different it's it's uh, it, i have a difficulty with listening and, and and an automatic reaction of preaching, which is a completely bad uh, bad uh, bad solution because it's you know it's it's it, it it changes the whole situation into this this British joke. I don't know if you are aware of the joke about uh, how a young young British parliamentarian was uh, was uh, taught about uh, the, the life and work of parliamentarian by an older person who also had experience in the parliament. So uh, as you know, the British parliament, they, 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 they sit on those both sides. So one side is one party and this, the second side is the other party. So the young one is sitting with the older one on one side and, and he says, look, on the other side, there are our enemies. Uh, and and uh, we have to fight with them. And the older smiles and says, be careful, young man, your enemies are here with us and the opponents are on the on the other side. So I, I think this this brings some some also important reflection about how we well we should treat the people on the other side as opponents not enemies but exactly the same with our own side because with the echo chambers it's very important it's, it's very easy that we also start to think about people who are similar but have those small differences as enemies this is extremely interesting that uh, the the practice of listening is is coming back here as this is exactly um, the notion that we are focusing on this this month within the grant reunion and I also observe while um, attending to different festivals recently mostly on zoom obviously that uh, many of the artists would also um, somehow get more interested with the practice of listening as on one hand a way to build intimacy with the interlocutor like to have a, a voice of somebody in your own ear brings and builds a kind of intimacy Mm -hmm. uh, when you can, especially when you cannot see the other physically, that's mm -hmm. one thing. But the other is also that uh, the listening seems to be something that we really were lacking last year. We were mm -hmm. mostly talking and preaching, but but ma we had almost no opportunity or maybe no patience to listen. And and I guess this is. I hope this is the practice we'll continue with. Mm -hmm. As our time is almost up, thank you so much. I just wanted to thank you, Carolina, a lot for your time, for sharing your thoughts, for being with us today. And I would love to say to all of our listeners and viewers that, um, that uh, the lecture is being recorded and you will be able to find it later on on our Grand Reunion website and our online magazine. Um, thank you so much, Carolina, for being with us. It's been a real joy to have you here.
Thank you so much, Marta. It has been a delight to be with you. And uh, if you have any other questions to me, I'm also very easily uh, accessible with Twitter, for example, or Facebook. So please do not hesitate to, to write. And ag again, thank you so much for the invitation. It has been a joy. Thank you.